What What do you make of the fact that, mm-hmm. of what happened on October 7th? Like, how do you think they were able to plan that attack and execute that attack? I mean, I, I've never been to Israel, but from everyone that I've talked to that's been there, yeah. they said you can't, you know, you can't sneeze on that border without an IDF soldier in your face. Well, they probably did it by, by keeping everybody segregated. And I think one of the reasons, by segregated, I mean like they had multiple cells, multiple operating cells, like mm-hmm. squads, like nine to 13 dudes. <clears throat> uh, what, now, the reason I believe this is that every single dude that was captured by the IDF who was involved in the raid said that they, pro- they were promised an apartment and $10,000. Now, here's why I think this was compartmentalized. I I believe that they had, I think it was around 2,000, 3,000 troops, mm-hmm. all of whom thought they were independent cells. Because if they didn't think that, they would have talked to each other and been like, hey, did they promise you an apartment? Oh, yeah, they promised me an apartment. How about you? Yeah, they promised me an apartment. Hold up. They promised all of us an apartment? How they, where are they going to get all these apartments from? Hmm. Right. Mm. So I think that's an indicator that now now Hamas lied, <laughs> you know, or or maybe they actually did think that they were going to be able to give those who survived and brought back a prisoner an apartment. If there was this coin operation that Israel conducted for the next five years, that might have happened. Right. But instead, they got a sledgehammer to the face. Right. 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 So all these dudes were motivated. I'm going to go. I'm going to capture prisoners. And I'm going to bring them back because then I get an apartment. But. Be, and they never talked outside their cell because they were told not to. So I think what we had, I believe it was, I want to say it was more than 13. I want to say it was probably around 30 cells that breached the border fence in Israel mm-hmm. and and uh, and started running running amok. So 30, 30 cells, 100, you know, 10 guys each. So it was how many how many of them were there total i i want to say it was between 300 so it's a tough one right because one of the things that people did was that some dudes noticed the hole open in the fence and they just ran through and were grabbing like air conditioners tires i mean these are all things they can't necessarily get right right? because of the embargo so Mm. you're you're a palestinian dude and your wife is like it's hot well (laughs) fence is open yeah (laughs) Honey, you know, I'm going to Sears, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I'll be right back. So, you know, what are you going to do, right? Mm. Um, so, actually, I don't recall the exact number of people. Between three, 300 and 3,000, right? right? So, it depends on, on what you count as a, as a, as a, as a guy, as mm. a, as a, as a, as a and how militant. does and how does the Mossad? I mean, mm-hmm. how does the Mossad miss this with all the communications that they can intercept <laughs> and all the intelligence they have? I mean, they're able to. I had John yeah. Kariaku on here mm-hmm. a couple of times, and he t- tells me about how they were able to uh, figure out how the Hamas and some of these guys that were inside of Gaza they were literally communicating to each other mm-hmm. on um, backgammon. I uh, yes, yeah. game apps. Yeah. Yeah, like the chat feature game. on the game apps, which is insane. Yeah, a number a little while back, there were I know there were people online who were saying, "Ryan, talk to us about this this ban on or the government wanted to be able to look at game app mm-hmm. stuff without a warrant." That, well, that's why, right? Because it was it was from and stuff that's like how that. the uh, San Bernardino shooter yeah. was communicating as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The uh, so I think a lot of it was uh, it was just face to face contact. They're doing this in small cells. And the other thing is that like it's it's just such a Tom Clancy kind of thing to to uh to believe. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, they're not gonna do that. Like that's a Tom Clancy movie, right? Mm-hmm. Three thousand people stream over the border, raid, grab people, bring them back. That, that's like a Clancy novel. Mm-hmm. And you know, Israel might have believed that like, all right, a couple of cells might come across the border. And that might have been why they kept it down to you know the individual cells as well. I don't think any of these cells knew what other cells were doing. Now, maybe right. battalion commanders knew or company commanders knew. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, at the individual level, individual squad level, they thought they were the only ones. Mm. Right. So they go over. It. So we, if Israel did intercept stuff, they're like, oh, it's just another freaking squad doing their stupid BS stuff. Maybe we'll come over the border. We'll get them when they do. Don't worry about it. Mm. Yeah, I'll be sad there. There, there, there's a time I pronounce it wrong again, like 
Israelis go like, you're pronouncing it wrong. Well, right, I speak right. Arabic. Sorry, guys. But they, there's a saying in Israel. Yeah, said, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah, a couple of guys. Yeah, yeah said, we'll take care of it. Don't mm. worry. Right. So <clears throat> it could have been that. And now when you're seeing dudes like with uh, with hang gliders, <laughs> you know, like those powered, what are they called, ultralights? Like, Good oh, Lord. wow, they have an ultralight club now? It's a heck of a club for an open-air prison to have. How yeah. come they have ultralights? Uh-huh. <laughs> like, that's, that's kind of a, that probably would, in the intelligence community, this is what we call a clue. Right? <laughs> like, why is there suddenly an ultralight club mm. popping up in Gaza? Right. Maybe I, I would have investigated that mm-hmm. a little bit, but I... So, you know, one of the ways they, they hit the border, some came through tunnels, some came through the fence, some came through ultralights, some came by the ocean. Right. They came in on boats. Right. Small boats. So, uh, the ultralight thing, I'm still, uh, that still blows me away. Yeah, that is pretty insane like, that they were I, able to do that. That, that. Yeah, I wouldn't have even, wouldn't have even thought of that. Like, that wouldn't have, So, it could have just been that Israel missed it because it, it was just such a... A crazy thought. Mm. Now the other thing is, people have said that like a lot of a lot of the women, a lot of so female conscripts, a lot of them were tasked with monitoring the border. You know, a lot of women they go into intelligence positions or mm-hmm. into uh, into um, what do you call it, uh, administrative positions. So mm-hmm. you might you might be a conscript and you're like, hey, sir, you bring this up to your commanding officer. Hey, these guys are doing hang gliding. Eh, what do you know? Right? right? You're just you're just here for two years, and I get another one who looks just like you. Go back, go back to your computer. Don't talk to me about this again. Mm-hmm. It's my best Israeli accent I could do. <laughs> You know, and, and they're like, dude, but, you know, so who are you going to go to next, right? Yeah. Like, my boss told me that, and I'll be like, all right, well, you know what? I did my job. It's on him now. Right. Right? Mm. It's on him. If he if he wants to ignore this and tell, all right, I'm going home at the end of the day. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's just um it's just hard to wrap your head around when you're someone like me and you're looking mm-hmm. at and you're looking at all this stuff like this and trying to understand how people think in that part of the world and if you haven't been there it's it's really really hard to understand what it must be like especially living in that part of the world where yeah. like you're surrounded by enemies, you know, you're in, you're so vulnerable. There are Palestinians who have the key that they had. Have you heard of the term the Nakba? Al Nakba? Uh uh-uh. uh. So um during the war of, of independence, Israel's independence, um many Arabs that were on the land, what we call Palestinians today, you'd call I guess Palestinians back then too, right? Arabs that lived on, on the land, <clears throat> uh many of them were kicked off their land. Some by the Jews that were taking areas and some by other Arabs, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, Syrians, they're told, get off the land, you can come back when we've killed all the Jews, right? So these dudes left. And a lot of the ones who ended up in Gaza, they're the ones who never had anything to come back to because they lost their homes during the Nakba. Al Nakba means catastrophe, the catastrophe. Oh. And there are some people who have like that the key to the house that they that they owned mm-hmm. is like a totem and it's in a in like a box like a picture of frame hanging on their wall if they still have a wall today wow it's hanging on a wall and that's the key that one day we will return one day we will push the jews into the sea and we will return to our home like Whoa. and it, this has now been two generations since the nakba Right, since the catastrophe, and so that's kind of the, the what we're working with here. And when you do, I'm, when you do talk to Palestinians who went through that, as I think maybe only a third of the people in Gaza were original residents, like mm-hmm. they had farms and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And initially, Egypt ran Gaza. Yeah, it was mm. after the Six Day War that Egypt was like, you know what, you can keep that. Right, right. <laughs> you know, like uh-huh. you, that's that's all that's all you, boo. Mm. You deal with that. Mm. <clears throat> um. It, uh, life sucks. 